Okay, buddy, I'm going to try and keep this video kind of short. This video is specifically for you, but uh, anybody else that wants to watch and, and along and enjoy. So this is the power supply. was on the bench. Um, it came off. You had said you wanted a uh, lab-type power supply that has current limits, so here you go. Um, a lot older than I thought, too. I couldn't remember. It's been so long since I had this thing out to where I could see it. 1968. So... There's a date stamp right there, December 24th, 19... It looks like 66, but it's 68 because the caps in it are all labeled 1968, all the transistors. So, yeah, I'm going to say uh, 1968. Um, really quick uh, setting one of these. Uh, this is like a lot of even some of the modern switch mode power supplies. They don't have, you know, when you set the current limit on these, there's... And these the... The course, course adjust for the voltage are both, and you can see the voltage dropped down to zero because it's no current, but turn that back up. But uh, these are 10 turn pots, and then the fine adjustments are uh, single turn pots. Um, there's no enable button, old, and like I said, even a lot of modern switch mode power supplies don't have that. So you have to short the, the output jacks to set your current limit. So I've got some double banana plugs that I use for that purpose. So what you do is just you know, short the input or the output, and then you can adjust your current. So if you need, let's say, 10 amps, and God, remember, you're not hurting the power supply. It's meant to put out that amount of current through that, so it's not like it's dead short in a normal power supply where it's going to blow up. This is a laboratory supply that has current limit, so that's what it's doing. It's limiting the current. So, you know, you can set it to 10 amps or, you know... Um, people might ask, well, why do you want that? Well, if you're working on a radio, let's say it's got a dead short, um, inside, or it's got a, a problem that keeps blowing the fuse. Uh, you don't want to keep installing, you don't want to install a larger fuse because you could end up blowing circuit traces off the board, doing serious damage inside the radio. So what you can do is, let's say it has a 3 amp fuse. Well, you don't want to set this at 3 amps. What you can do is, because normally in receive it's going to draw very little power, you can set this down to like 1 amp or even like a half amp or something. But you put it down at a much more reasonable level. And then you just take your jumper out and it's ready to use. You know, set your voltage, whatever operating voltage you need. So actually on a radio, you know, 13.8, so right about there, you know. And then you'd have your, put your uh, your plug in here. And it's still, you can see it's still sitting down there at 1 amp. That hasn't changed. So the, the voltage and, and current controls are completely independent. Um, and then when you hook this up to that radio that has a dead short in it, it will not allow the power supply to put out more than 1 amp or whatever you set it to. Now, you'll see the voltage drop. Matter of fact, if you notice, when I had the jumper in, there's no voltage showing. It's showing current, but no voltage. That's because there's a dead short. So, And you'll notice that when it get when you get to a current limit. When it hit, it finally hits that current limit, you'll see the voltage start to drop. Uh, that's just how, how power supplies work. Um, like I say, this one's old, old as the hills. It's an old linear style, so this is not your modern switch mode power supply. Um... The meter is off slightly on this, just a little bit, so it does need to be calibrated. I'm trying to get the needle, to split the needle there at 10 volts. And if we hook up to the voltmeter up here, you can see we're at, is that, yeah, that's right around, I'm actually I'm a little over, right about there, yeah. Say right about there, so like ten point you know three. Um, so you know it reads the the power supply is putting out a little less than showing on the meter. So it does need to be calibrated. But there's yeah there's lots of calibration pots on the inside, so that shouldn't be a biggie. Um, now the other thing I wanted to show was these are very quiet supplies. So here's an oscilloscope. <laughs> now not attached to anything. So let's turn the power supply off. I'm gonna hook up the ground lead of the scope to the negative on the power jack here on the front and the scope probe is now attached to the power output jacks now this power supply remember is turned off so that's just line noise i've got the volt the voltage per division set set at its uh minimum <laughs> you know the lowest lowest it can go so that's just like i said you can see just getting this probe close to the ac cord down here there's this you new know, that's just moving the scope probe like that. It's just picking up the you know 60 hertz hum out of the air. <laughs> so, 
and we'll turn the power supply on so you can see how much how much noise there is here okay I turn it on so pretty much the same thing as it was when it was off so yeah it's a very quiet supply um, Now, internally, built like a tank. Now, when I got this thing, and you're getting it for the same price, I, I think I paid 30 bucks for this. That's what you're getting it for. Um, hell, as much as this as much as much this thing weighs, it's probably worth that much in scrap metal. But uh, uh, when I got this, uh, it was an unknown condition, and they had it wrapped in like a you know craft wrapping paper as like a first layer in the packaging, and it was oil-soaked. The original big can cap right here had leaked. Now, they... Uh, it was a really good cap, all of them in here. They're either Sprague or, uh, I think the big ones are GE, might have been, or it, uh, no, they were Sprague, both Sprague. But anyhow, really big can cap, and the phenolic in the end of it, where the terminals come out, that's actually where they had a vent. So it's not like a lot of can caps where you'll see a crimp line that they put in there, so if it ever needs to vent, the can actually ruptures. This actually had a little metal plug in it with a rubber inside of it, an actual little vent, vent plug. And I, it, it looked like the only thing that was really wrong with it was the rubber had deteriorated. You remember, 19, 1968, the rubber had deteriorated and the oil was just oozing out of the hole. So, you know, I brought it up on a Variac, uh, you know, an external Variac variable power supply. I turned it on. It actually worked fine. Yeah, now, eventually that cap was going to fail because the oil had uh, all run out of it, but it was still working fine. But uh, So on the inside here... Now the original can cap was much much bigger, <laughs> so I had to pad out this one. So this isn't foam; this is actually rubber. Uh, it's 3M, you know, backing on there. But uh, there's actually rubber hard, you know, fairly hard rubber in in there to make up the padding. So yeah, that's that can you can almost pick this power supply up by that cap. It's that's not going anywhere. Um, no, actually, yeah, okay, Sprague. Um, but yeah, date code 1968. Transistors have 1968 date codes. So somebody had installed the double banana plugs on the front. Um, eh, you know, neither here nor there. I guess that's actually makes it does make it really convenient to use. The output terminals are actually on the back of this thing, but they were, you know, they did at least put a, you know, a little bit of uh, filtering on here. So it's got a big, big ferrite core on here. They ran a power line through. Um, yeah, big honking transformer on this thing. Uh, that's where most of the weight in this thing comes from. Now, the top and bottom perforated covers, those are aluminum, but all the rest of this structure is steel, except for the faceplate, that's also aluminum. And you can you, know, you can see how thick that is. Uh, that's aluminum, but all all the rest of it's all steel. And yeah, this thing here, that's a that's a monster. Um, well, like I say, I stuck that cap in there. I've been using this thing for years, and it works just fine. Now, it has that early electronics hum so when you turn it on the um, it sits there and just sings along nothing wrong with it that's just the nature of the beast anyways i've got a couple other old antique pieces of test equipment and they all do that they all have that have that uh, electric hum to them um back here at the business end nice big monster cast uh heat sinks uh as you can see lots of calibration pots now, I do, I'm do. i not sure if I have an uh, owner's service manual for this. Not that you need an owner's manual. It's kind of self-explanatory. But as far as a service manual for calibration, I can't remember if I didn't. I know it didn't come with one, but I can't remember if I found one online and downloaded it. I'll, I'll look and see if I have one or not. Um, like I say, the meter is off a little bit. It's, it's putting out a little bit less voltage than what is shown uh, or no, was it more? No, it's putting out a little bit more than what's on the the meter so yeah because I had it at 10 and it was putting out like 10.3 so it's putting out just a little bit more voltage um, so you know that like I say lots of calibration points but it looks like everything's original other than this one can cap that I replaced um, real early you can tell I mean these these are diodes no they're not electrolytic capacitors it's probably what a lot of people are looking at them thinking because you can see right there it's got a diode logo and says CR so yeah this is definitely 60s vintage electronics but uh, yeah, like I say, it works fine. I mean, you find me a modern day switch mode power supply that, uh, well, this thing's 68, so 70, 80, 90, 2000. I mean, it's almost 50 years old. In two years, it'll be 50. Matter of fact, it's coming up damn close to it, you know, because it is December. Um, 
this thing would be close to 50 years old and it still works. And the only reason that original can cap had to be replaced was the rubber deteriorated in the damn vent plug. If it hadn't been for that, I think it would still be working just fine. Um, so this one's a, I think this might be a little bit higher rating than the one I stuck in here, but this is a 70,000 microfarad, 40 working volt or 50 volt surge. So, um, so there you go. I just thought I'd show this to you. Uh, I'll have to get this thing boxed up. I think I was going to put something else in there, a Christmas present for you in the box with this, but yeah, I think even, even as good as I package, I don't think I'm going to chance it. This thing is really freaking heavy. Um, <laughs> I mean, ridiculously. So, so I think it's this is just going to go in its own individual box. Um, I, I really don't want a chance putting that other play toy in with it because uh, that thing will get crushed. <laughs> I, I I could probably do it, but I just I'm I'm one of those rather safe than sorry when it comes to packaging stuff. So yeah, I think this is just going to get its own uh, its own package. But uh, there you go. There's just a quickie overview. Um, you know, now I personally like linear power supplies like this better. Switch mode power supplies, yeah, they're great. They've got lots of features, but you know something, honestly, they're not that reliable. That's why electronics nowadays, you know, your televisions, all that crap, nothing lasts anymore. You know what always goes wrong in them? Power supplies. And usually caps. And that's because they're, you know, they've got caps running at hundreds of volts and they've run at really high frequencies and. Yeah, you find me a modern-day switch mode laboratory power supply that in 50 years' time is still working fine, yeah, probably not going to happen. Back in the old days, yeah, this old shit, as long as the rubber hasn't deteriorated, pff, it's still working fine. So, you know, they're just more, so much more reliable, and they're less prone to making noise. <laughs> That's the other problem with switch mode power supplies. They're operating at really high frequencies, and you can get all kinds of crap, then you have to filter out... So these just by nature are a lot quieter in the RF spectrum, you know, for using it on your repair bench. And like that's why I showed it hooked up to the scope, really quiet. <laughs> the only noise coming out of that jack was the same noise it had when it was turned off. That's just, you know, basically whatever was being, you know, amp picked up by my, you know, hand and any, you know, surrounding in the air. It, re it really has no noticeable ripple or anything. Just a really ultra high end. Oh, and by the way, it's a... Harrison Laboratories, so yeah, built in, built in the U.S., in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, uh, 6263A, and it's 0 to 18 volts, 0 to 10 amps, now it says 10, but it'll actually go to 12 volts, and or 12 amps and 20 volts, but uh, there you go, buddy, so that's a picture of the monster I was telling you about.